Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second iteration of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation's 2022 Summer Webinar Series. My name is Joe Mullen, and I'm the Northeastern States Manager for the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Our topic for this discussion is one that CSF and today's panelists are intimately familiar with, recent legislative efforts to curb the hunting of big five species by American sportsmen and women through trophy import bans. Before we get going, I wanna remind everyone that the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation is recording today's presentation. However, any recording, rebroadcast or retransmission of the presentation or any of its parts by the attendees without the expressed written consent of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation is prohibited. I'd also like to take a minute to highlight some functions for you. Down below on your screen, you'll see the chat icon. CSF will be dropping some related links in this area for your convenience. Additionally, towards the end of today's discussion, we have some time set aside to address your questions. So please feel free to utilize the Q&A function. Now, we have a fantastic lineup of panelists for this session, and I cannot express our gratitude enough that they are taking the time to join us to discuss this crucial topic. Since 1989, CSF has dedicated itself to the mission of working with Congress governors and state legislatures to protect and advance hunting, angling, recreational shooting and trapping. The unique and collective force of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, the Governor's Sportsman's Caucus and the National Assembly of Sportsman's Caucuses working closely with CSF and with the support of major hunting, recreational fishing and shooting and trapping organizations serves as an unprecedented network of pro sportsman elected officials that advance the conservation interests of America's hunters and anglers. It is through this network that CSF has been able to work with elected officials, agency staff, and national conservation partners to fight these restrictive trophy import bans. To put it simply, legislative attempts to prohibit the import of big five species serves no purpose other than to unduly punish legal hunting in African nations, deflecting necessary funding for anti-poaching programs, while also financially crippling rural communities that are in great need of the economic support. In many Southern and Eastern African countries, revenues generated from legal hunting are the primary source of management, conservation, and anti-poaching funds for national wildlife authorities. Preventing hunters from importing harvested animals is intended to discourage them from hunting in Africa at all, thus depriving African wildlife authorities and communities of essential income. Additionally, without the financial and game meat contributions from legal hunting, Local communities have little incentive to protect game, which is otherwise viewed as a nuisance or threat. Over the past decade, CSF has seen an increase in legislative efforts to ban the import of certain legally harvested African species. In 2016, New Jersey passed legislation that restricted residents from importing and possessing lawfully harvested trophies from big five species. Groups, including Conservation Force, were successful in challenging the state and federal court under the claim that the new law violated Section 6F of the Endangered Species Act, to which the court agreed, removing the importation and possession ban. In 2018, then Governor of California, Edmund G. Brown, vetoed Senate Bill 1487, which would have established the iconic African Species Protection Act. In his veto message, the governor stated that Senate Bill 1487 imposes a state civil penalty for activities expressly authorized by the U.S. Endangered Species Act, emphasizing that this bill, if enacted, would be unenforceable. Just last year in Connecticut, a similar trophy import ban was put forward. Despite opposition from its own Fish and Wildlife Agency, the legislature proceeded with advancing the bill. CSF worked with leaders of the Connecticut Legislative Sportsman's Caucus, as well as groups on today's panel, towards the introduction of a carve out for instances where the possession of such specimen is expressly authorized by federal law or permit. The instances I highlight do not make up an exhaustive list. We've seen and often opposed these bans elsewhere, such as New York, New Hampshire, Maryland, and Washington, to name a few. However, this isn't just a state level issue. As recently as this week, CSF has been hard at work alongside the very organizations on this panel in opposing federal restrictions, more specifically, Section 439 and Fiscal Year 2023, Department of the Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act which would completely ban the import of legally hunted trophies from Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. That's why it's so exciting to have our panelists joining us today. They themselves, as well as their organizations, 
have tenured histories with working on this crucial topic. As I mentioned before, we have a great agenda plan for you today. I'd like to reiterate our appreciation to not only the panelists for this discussion, but for all those of you in attendance who have a shared interest in this critical topic. Starting things off, we have Ben Cassidy, Executive Vice President of International Government and Public Affairs for Safari Club International. In his role, he oversees SCI's government relations, legal advocacy, and communications efforts. Ben joined SCI from the US Department of the Interior where he served as Senior Deputy Director for the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs and as Senior Policy Advisor for Water and Science. Previously, he worked for the National Rifle Association's Institute for Legislative Action and the National Republican Congressional Committee. Ben, welcome. Joe, thanks so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> thanks to Erica and Tom for, for joining us on the panel and uh, CSF for highlighting this incredibly important issue, as well as all of our attendees today for, for tuning in. I look forward to a great discussion. I'm gonna share my slides. We're getting started. All right, those should show, right? Trophies. Okay. So thanks a lot for the introduction. Ben Cassidy with Safari Club International. Um, SCI, we have members in 107 countries. And regardless of where they live, our members are, all have two things in common. They're active conservationists and they're active hunters. Across the world, hunting is an essential tool for conservation. It benefits wildlife, habitat, and the people who live alongside these resources. In fact, hunting is central to conservation in parts of Africa, where it is the driver of revenue to local communities. Without hunting, we would not see the abundance of wildlife that resides in Southern Africa today. Which leads me to my next slide. Can do it. The numbers don't lie. One sec. As you can see on the chart here, African countries that incorporate regulated hunting into their national conservation programs are the most successful in conserving large mammals. Botswana, Namibia, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Mozambique have the largest populations of megafauna. Just look at those percentages. Of all the Africans I've met who live alongside wildlife, none has ever imparted that it's easy living. In fact, it can be dangerous and at times devastating to livelihoods. It's tolerated and protected though, because models have been adopted throughout Southern Africa that support local economies while ensuring healthy wildlife populations for generations to come. There's a disconnect though between those who want to end hunting and the reality that we are seeing on the ground in Africa. If proponents of trophy bans would take the time to consider the implications on wildlife and livelihoods, they might just pause in promoting these misguided and harmful attempts. My first recommendation would be consulting with ind indigenous people before pushing bans. And that sounds simple, but it rarely occurs. These bans do nothing to, to address the underlying issues, notably poaching and habitat loss. Rather, they exacerbate the problems. It would be absolutely wrong and insulting to think that range countries don't recognize these underlying issues and are not determined to address them. But when other countries consider legislation to undermine these countries' conservation programs, they imply just that. Still, this doesn't stop politicians from introducing ill-conceived trophy bans and legislatures around the world. So at the international level, I wanna to touch on that before coming back in local. Um, we've been fighting ban attempts in the European Parliament, United Kingdom, Belgium, Switzerland, and Finland. Lots of fires burning over there, different degrees of temperature, um, but it's all the same fight going on. Um, Parliament, we're currently going through uh, fighting a resolution that's going through a process, very important that, that we're able to pro have, have the, the European Commission's position on importation um, represented rather than this resolution, especially going into the CITES COP. The United Kingdom states ground zero for trophy ban fights, um, recently had their animals abroad bill. Um, it is it is stalled out during this session of parliament after a lot of engagement from African communities. Um, 
in Belgium, we saw their parliament pass a uh, trophy ban. It's now currently resides with the prime minister um, who's considering it. We were able to set up meetings with him and with the Namibian government um, in which, you know, frankly, the Belgian parliament was red faced for having not consulted. In Switzerland, we're able to defeat trophy ban just this last month in June. And just this week in uh, recent news, uh, Finland is now considering a trophy ban. So across the pond, but also fighting the fights that we are fighting here in the United States. This brings me to zombie legislation, legislation that you take it out and it comes right back. Um, in the US, we're seeing that at the federal level and at the state level. At the federal level, <clears throat> appropriation has been the vehicle of choice, um, specifically through riders to block funding for processing of permits. Um, outright bans contradict, like Joe had mentioned, section, or he, had, he mentioned 6F, uh, but section 9C2 of the Endangered Species Act, it facilitates the importation of non-threatened species uh, for non-commercial purposes. In essence, it provides a presumption of legality that trophy bans ignore. Uh, so recent federal attempts, they found their way into the appropriations process rather than through standalone legislation. Just this week, in fact, uh, we've seen appropriations language to ban importation uh, resurface as Section 439, as you see on the screen, the Interior Appropriations Bill. Um, as Joe had mentioned, it targets, and as you see in the legislation, uh, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and, Zim and, Zim and Zambia. Uh, the irony here is that this language, it was introduced just after a Biden administration decision that recognized elephant hunting in Zimbabwe benefits the enhancement of the species. And try to figure that out, right? And it takes us down into the states. We're playing a bit of whack-a-mole. Joe, I think, did a very good job of, of walking through um, kind of how the table has been set. But it all really does go back to, as Joe mentioned, um, New Jersey, when they passed uh, a trophy ban in 2016, uh, which, which hunters and conservation force, other organizations uh, were able to overturn um, and throw out, and that was based off of Section 6F of the Endangered Species Act, that states cannot prohibit something that is permitted by the ESA. In this instance, um, processing of permits for trophies, importation. Um, as Joe had mentioned, 2018 saw Governor Jerry Brown veto a trophy ban, um, yet the antis in California persisted uh, in 2020, introduced and uh, moved through the process, the Iconic Species Act. It got all the way up to the, to the finish line in 2020. It was buried within a COVID relief package. That was all that they were saying they were con gonna consider in the California legislature during 2020, um, but stuffed in this Iconic Species Act to shut down trophy bans, uh, but it died. Time expired and it did not pass. And this really goes to the power of connecting local voices with decision makers, regardless of where it is in the world. Uh, just a shiny example in California um, with author uh, African authorities, management authorities, community leaders talking directly to assembly and Senate members in California. Um, very, uh, re really changed a lot of minds, or opened a lot of eyes that, that previously hadn't really looked at the issue. Um, most specifically, the California Black Caucus, um, who took to the floor, um, gave a number of impassioned uh, speeches in opposition to the Iconic Species Act. Um, there were, these are a lot of members, you know, representing places like downtown Los Angeles that normally don't engage in this, but had seen how it's you know, not a no-brainer, but something that really isn't good for conservation or local communities. Um, so at the end of the day, time expired and the bill died. Um, Connecticut, another bill that was, you know, affected um, by the New Jersey decision. Um, it did pass, but in the final stages was amended uh, to clarify that nothing in the bill would supersede federal law, I mean, virtually defanging it. I always have to bring up New York because it's the most recent. Um, you know, they, they adjourned uh, just this month um, with the bill, you know, close to a finish line, um, but never went to the governor's desk. Again, I, I see it as seeing what had happened with their neighbors in New Jersey. Um, and not wanting to waste government resources and time on language that wouldn't stand uh, up in a court. Um, 
safe to say that we also were pretty clear that if it were to become law, we had some very eager lawyers um, on the team uh, ready to sue and win. So that that died. But, you know, it, it, we, we'd anticipate it comes back in all these places. Because um, again, you have politicians that are just doing this for, for free points, not really thinking about what the repercussions are. Let's see my PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, so right now, the number of attempts that are happening, it's um, unprecedented. The variety of legislatures that are taking these bans up is growing. The facts remain the same. Hunting is a central tool for conservation across the globe. Local communities rely on hunting dollars to support themselves. And species populations have been enhanced where regulated hunting occurs. So before politicians propose bans, they need to research the facts and more importantly, consult with the communities who live alongside the wildlife and are doing a great job of managing their resources. Again, the numbers don't lie. So thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel and some Q&A at the end. Thank you. Ben, I want to thank you again for taking part in today's webinar and for serving as a reliable resource for all of us at CSF. Joining us next, we have Erica Turgeson, Government Affairs Director for Dallas Safari Club. Erica joined Dallas Safari Club's newly formed Government Affairs Department. There we go. Based in Washington, DC, bringing with her more than 20 years of experience in natural resource policy and politics. She previously served as staff for the House Appropriations Committee and House Natural Resources Committee and has extensive experience testifying before Congress, representing organizations before the U.S. House, Senate, and administration, drafting and negotiating legislation, and advising on policy actions. Most recently, Erica served as the Senior Advisor and Director of Hunting Policy for the National Rifle Association's Institute for Legislative Action. In this position, Erica served as a spokesperson and policy advisor on Second Amendment and hunting conservation issues. Erica, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you to Congressional Sportsman's Foundation for bringing this important issue up. Um, and also to Ben and Tom for joining us in this as well. Um, I wanted to start, let me get my screen to share here. Uh, kind of building off of what Ben said, I think it's really important to note that there's no scientific backing for this import ban, just as um, Ben kind of mentioned. And if we want to look at one country as an example, um, for any of you who have been to Kenya, I have when I was there. Um, in my experience, the locals kind of bragged about the fact that they didn't have any hunting. Well, if you look at their numbers of wildlife, um, it's actually gone down on average by 68% between 1977 when they banned hunting and 2016. So as you can see, banning hunting didn't do anything to protect the wildlife and actually um, the reverse happened there. And then as Ben was talking about on the international level, there are so many, um, different um, bans that are being proposed in different countries, the EU, um, the UK, and of course here in the United States. But there are quite a few highly respected scientific bodies that have actually published briefing papers or scientific papers on um, so-called trophy hunting abroad and have recognized the fact, and they were brave to do so, that without hunting in many of these areas, there's no way to sustain the wildlife. And right here's a quote from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, um, certainly not what we would consider a right-wing organization. Um, and then also, this is a recent one from the Society for Conservation Biology, um, it just came out. And this is actually important because it shows you that if there is a hunting ban, there is nothing that would replace the conservation that is currently taking place because of hunting in many of these rural areas. 
So I think one of the most important things to do when we're talking about this, and especially when you're trying to talk to other people who um, maybe haven't experienced Africa, you know, Africa is a developing continent. It's very unique. Each country is unique. Each area um, within different countries are unique. In some areas, they have great wildlife populations and populations are increasing or overpopulated. In other areas, um, there's a decline. So you can't, you can't paint Africa with one broad stroke. And I think that some of the recent um, articles that have been out there from Africans actually bring this home more than anything else. Um, back when the Cecil the Lion issue kind of erupted and exploded on social media, there was an op-ed from a young man who was here in the United States to uh, getting his graduate degree. And he grew up in a rural um, Zimbabwe village. And I'm just gonna quote from his op-ed. He said, Cecil who, I wondered, when I turned on the news and discovered that the messages were about a lion killed by an American dentist, the village boy inside me instinctively cheered, one lion fewer to menace families like mine. Said my excitement was doused when I realized that the lion killer was being painted as the villain. I faced the starkest cultural contradiction I'd experienced during my five years studying in the United States. In my village in Zimbabwe, surrounded by wildlife conservation areas, no lion has ever been beloved or granted an affectionate nickname. They are the objects of terror. And then another example, this was recently published um, in an article in Forbes in May. And so far this year, 60 Zimbabweans have lost their lives to elephants. 50 have been injured. Um, in 2021, that was 70 people. Um, and imagine if that happened in the United States. Um, we would not allow for that. But I think it paints a picture of um, wildlife that there's a lot of conflict in Africa. And when wildlife is threatening your livelihood and your lives, um, you can understand why this is a much bigger issue than the way it's portrayed in the United States through social media or through, um, you know, different shows or cartoons that turn animals basically into humans. And here's a great quote from the Forbes article. It says, what is clear is that removing recreational hunting from the equation eliminates much of the incentive for most Africans to tolerate wildlife in the first place. Without the employment, meat, and funds for communities that foreign hunters provide, to say nothing of the significant private donations made by those hunters to schools, orphanages, and clinics, an African sees a lion the same way a Western rancher looks upon a coyote. If an animal doesn't bring value to the African people, it is often expendable. The other point I wanted to bring up was that here in the United States, we manage our wildlife and we do a great job of it. And in many places in Africa, they do the same. And it really is um, colonial and disrespectful for us to try to tell Africa how they can manage their wildlife. Um, especially for the more stable countries that have proven over and over again that they are capable of managing their wildlife populations. Uh, the other point that I think is often lost by the folks that are advocating for these bans is that hunting is already heavily regulated. Not only does each country, just like the United States and each area have different wildlife population surveys, monitoring, uh, but they also set quotas, for hunting, you have to get a hunting license, permits, all of those type of things. Um, then we have an international body. It's the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. It's a treaty that the United States and um, over a hundred other countries have signed on to. And this really dictates which animals are allowed to be hunted based on the population data, based on the science. Um, and, and which aren't, which are endangered and should be completely off limits. So the United States is already a signatory to that and we have to um, participate and regulate according to CITES. We do that through our Endangered Species Act here. And that means that the Fish and Wildlife Service also has to grant you a permit if you were gonna 
to go hunting abroad, you have to apply for a permit. The Fish and Wildlife Service will research that permit, ensure that the country is managing their wildlife sustainably, that the data that the country um, has is accurate. Um, and sometimes they'll even ask a country for some follow-up questions and some additional data to make sure that what is on the permit is accurate and that by um, importing that harvested animal, it is truly conserving it in its home nation. And finally, the other thing that is often forgotten, we talk a lot about how $100 truly fund wildlife conservation. Well, in this case, um, in the case of Africa and a lot of developing countries where there is hunting, you have to realize there is nothing else in those areas. These are the areas outside of the photographic safaris. Um, the photographic safaris are also wonderful, but they can only take place in certain areas. So these are very remote areas. They're um, historically very poor areas and hunting dollars pay for anti-poaching units, um, community infrastructure, of course, meat donations, um, more monitoring and conservation of, um, of wildlife. And just in addition to the fees that hunters pay when they go to Africa or um, some other nation, they also have like, for example, um, Dallas Safari Club has a huge foundation. Safari Club International has a huge foundation and spend a great deal of money on grant making to anti-poaching, for example, or to collaring and helping to monitor wildlife or on reintroduction projects in areas where um, the wildlife have been poached, for example. So hunters really put their money where their mouth is and international organizations um, like SCI and like DSC, we do a lot beyond, above and beyond um, what we pay in our hunting fees, for example, to be sure that we conserve wildlife abroad. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Erica, thank you again for all of your insight and for serving as a panelist in this conversation. Next up, we have Tom Opre, filmmaker and founder of the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. A film director, cinematographer, television producer, and wildlife conservationist, Tom has made educating the public on wildlife conservation and stewardship issues a main priority. As the past president of the Professional Outdoor Media Association, he has worked to help other outdoor communicators and industry leaders understand and present a unified message regarding the top issues facing wildlife conservation today. Since 1990, Tom has produced and or directed national television commercial projects for Fortune 500 companies, feature films, and episodic television. In 2015, he wrapped a seven-year primetime run on NBC Sports, producing the highest rated award-winning television show in the outdoor field sports genre. Eye of, the tie, Eye of the Hunter. His latest project, Killing the Shepherd, is a documentary feature film telling the story of a rural indigenous community in Zambia and their struggle to survive, attempting to realize benefits from their hard work in wildlife and habitat conservation. The film has been selected by 38 film festivals worldwide and won 20 major awards, including Best Feature Documentary, Best Indigenous Film, Best Human Rights Film, and Best Humans and Nature Film. Moving forward, his vision is to give a voice to rural indigenous communities around the world. Tom, thank you for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Hey Joe, thanks, uh, thanks for having me and, and thank you to all the other organizations and participants here on the call today. You know, this is a, a really timely and very important discussion that we all need to have. And I guess I'm the, the panelist to bring kind of the brutal truth about what really is occurring on the ground. Uh, most people here, especially in the Western world, get their information uh, about wildlife and wildlife issues from either the media, social media, or Walt Disney World. And unfortunately, what you or what a lot of people are being fed is, is not at all what's going on on the ground. So uh, I spent about 120 days in country over the course of three and a half years in Zambia with a uh, rural community, uh, very remote, 
led by a woman chief and literally uh, documented them uh, trying to break the bonds of, of absolute poverty. And uh, it was an incredible story. But I think what people need to understand is, uh, you know, let, let's give a little bit of history here. Uh, we, we heard from Erica and Ben talking about a lot of things that sportsmen and that, that conservation ethos that uh, originated back in, you know, turn of the 20th century with folks like Teddy Roosevelt. Hey, Tom, I'm sorry I'm going to have to interrupt you here. It seems like some folks are having uh, um, issues with the audio. Um, Testing, one, two, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I do have one of those deep, low voices. Give me one second, Tom. I'm trying to figure it out. In the meantime, I'm going to play the uh, the trailer for your film, if that's all right, uh, while we try and figure out this audio issue. This film needs to be a must-see for anyone interested in wildlife and conservation. I've never seen the gritty real-world realities, the complexities and the heartbreaking decisions involved in on-the-ground conservation portrayed so unflinchingly and so accurately. Do yourself and wildlife a favour. Watch Killing the Shepherd, open your mind and learn about the real world, not the world of glossy documentaries. I'm not wasting my time being in a place like this. Surely, surely we have failed or we are failing. This is how Africa was 100, 200 years ago. I mean, literally, they have got nothing. When we're done with this meeting, you go outside and you get a pick and a shovel. You see that big tree over there? You dig a hole that's six foot long, three feet wide, and six feet deep. And leave that hole like that. When I die, you take me and bury me in that hole. Chito! We earn the respect that we are being given by the people because of what we're doing with the people and not for the people, with the people. It is totally and utterly essential for every animal that's going to exist to be able to earn its own keep. When you work so hard to try and uplift the values and the way of life and the well-being of a community that have been down at that poverty level for such a long time, you get huge successes.
All right, Joe, we're going to try a different mic here. Do you hear me now? I can hear you fine. Um, I'm going to get another audio check and you're good to go. Awesome. Yeah, so basically that's the trailer for the film. Uh, and uh, as, as you said, the film ended up uh, being selected in 40 different film festivals to date. It's won 21 major awards. And so, and probably the most important awards for me as a filmmaker, especially after all the time and hours I spent with the people of Shekabeta, were the awards that we re recognize for social justice, indigenous and human rights issues. Uh, I mean, this is so important that these people see a benefit for taking care of their wildlife. And in this film, what we actually document is years of hard work. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, making the film was kind of like, uh, you know, dealing with uh, bipolar disease. I mean, it had huge highs and huge lows. And, uh, you know, if people really want to understand what's going on on the ground, I, I suggest watching that film. It's available on, I think, Prime, Amazon Prime and Tubi and uh, Zumo and at KillingTheShepherd.com. But that really will help people understand what's going on over there. You know, I, I asked a lot of these people about hunting bans, you know, the topic of today's discussion uh, there. And you have to remember, these people, um, they're pretty simple folks. Most of them are subsistence farmers. Uh, they're literally scratching out uh, a subsistence lifestyle on the land. And wildlife, uh, in the case of this particular area, had been almost eradicated because of overuse through poaching. Uh, most of that around bushmeat poaching. And uh, when the wildlife disappeared, uh, there really was no other resources uh, because they're in an area where literally trying to, to live in a subsistence farming lifestyle is very difficult. So uh, they uh, asked for a couple of folks to come and help them. They ended up getting a family of second and third generation white Zambians to come out that were tied to the hunting industry. Uh, they were professional hunters. And uh, over the course of five years, they turned this whole thing around so that not only were the wildlife populations flourishing and, and coming back in leaps and bounds, but the people uh, were seeing great benefits to the development and the efforts uh, by the safari hunting company and the family that was there uh, to the point now where uh, when I was there, you know, couple hundred kids were getting an education and now we just uh, worked with African children's schools and we had to buy 600 uh, uniforms for school. Uh, there's, there's probably close to 200 people now in the community that have either part-time or full-time employment when there were no jobs prior to the safari company coming. So I think what people really have to understand is that these people live in a, in a, in a just a totally foreign, very difficult uh, place. Not much like our ancestors probably in the 17 and 1800s here in North America. You know, you know, it's kind of scratching out a living. And uh, but these people have some incredible wildlife resources. And if they don't see a value to having that wildlife on the land, then they're going to get rid of it. Uh, you know, if, if the lion doesn't have a value because uh, an American sportsman who comes over and hunts it and drops, you know, tens of thousands, 80 to 100 thousand dollars on, on a lion hunt, uh, you know, if they don't see that value there, then they're going to poison those lions because, you know, the lions are going to eat what livestock they have and potentially could be a problem for their own families. So I think it's pretty important people understand that, you know, we've come a long way as a society, a Western society. You know, one of the big things right now in D.C. is, uh, you know, that uh, is pushing social justice issues. And uh, when I talk to the folks that are interested in, in, in uh, D.C. and pushing uh, wildlife trophy hunting bands, I just have to ask them, it's like, hey, at the end of the day, why are we doing this? I mean, first of all, we're not these people's masters. They live in their own uh, their own countries, their sovereign countries, and, and these people should see a benefit for their hard work in wildlife conservation. And so we, I think having that almost neo-colonialistic viewpoint of what's going on comes from the fact that we just, uh, I think there's just too much ignorance in our society and we just need to do a better job of understanding what the realities are on the ground so joe i didn't know if you had some questions i'm kind of like i said i don't have a fixed script here or anything all i can do is talk to to what i've seen on the ground yeah no and i appreciate that tom and, and thank you for for relaying all that to us um one that i'm wondering is where did the idea for this film come from where did where did it originate for you you know, back in 2016, I was asked uh, to present, uh, to do a presentation for a conservation 
uh, or, you know, actually there's a whole bunch of conservation organizations together, including Dallas Safari Club and SCI and uh, Conservation Force and all of the wildlife NGOs that are tied to uh, hunting. They had a conference in Atlanta uh, trying to, you know, it's kind of in the wake of the Cecil the Lion affair. And my uh, discussion was, uh, presentation was, you know, what is, how does the broader public perceive hunters today? And uh, so I put that presentation together and it's not a very pretty picture uh, because of there's a lot of ignorance. People don't understand that, you know, why we have wildlife in our backyards. And that's because of hunters, you know, 99 percent of the time. Uh, so uh, I happened to be there and, and a fellow named Roland Norton, who was the head of the Zambia Professional Hunters Association, listened to my presentation. And when we got done, he actually came over and talked to me and said, hey, I, I need to tell you this story. And he proceeded to tell me this crazy story about a, uh, a woman chief that had knocked on his door of his import export business because that was his mainstay and uh, asked him for some help because at the time her people were starving to death. They were dying. Uh, there was no UN, no NGOs. The government doesn't have the resources to help these people out. So she was crying for help. And, uh, and so after he told me this story, I was like, well, I got to go check this out, see if this really is the real deal. And when I went over there, uh, I was literally blown away. So I had, I had the opportunity to watch your film at last year's uh, NASC Summit. And, um, you know, I, I encourage everyone who is attending, we dropped the link in the, um, the chat box for all of you to go to the website and, uh, you know, navigate through there and be able to, to watch the film. But for those who haven't, Tom, can you tell us, you know, when you and your crew got over there, you're on the ground, um, can you paint a picture of what the, the dire wildlife population was like compared to, um, you know, checking in a few potentially years later? Yeah, I mean, I give people perspective. The Lower Luano is a game management area. That's what Zambia designates their, their hunting concessions. And this area had not had any legal hunting. It actually been declared as, as devoid of, of huntable animals uh, about five or ten years prior to, to when the Nortons first arrived, which was in 2015. Uh, you know, I... I didn't probably in the two weeks I spent there in 2017 and early 2017, I don't think I saw 15 or 20 animals. Uh, this is not the Serengeti. So, I mean, we're not uh, seeing mass migrations of wildlife or anything like that. It's a, it's a pretty remote, uh, very hospitable. I mean, just, it's a, it's a rugged, rough place surrounded by mountains in the very Southern part of, uh, uh, southeastern part of, of Zambia. Uh, to its north, you have the Luanga River coming down with it's part of the Rift Valley system coming out of Tanzania. Uh, and then it actually uh, butts up with the Lower Zambezi National Park. So it's right really southern part of the country. Um, you know, the wildlife lives in pretty thick country along the river uh, basins and so forth. You'll find more numbers of animals there, but there really wasn't, you know, I, I've probably been at the, on 40 or 50 African safaris and filming stuff all over Africa. And, and uh, the amount of wildlife I saw on our first trip was, was really pitiful. It was, it was uh, depressing. And the people there, I mean, I mean, these people were still grounding corn with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, by hand. Uh, and trying to just eke out a living. And it was interesting. One of the farmers I talked to, he's like, you know, Tom, I need about 30 bags of maize to uh, feed my family. He's got about eight kids. And uh, he literally said, I, I, I grow a third of my uh, food and my corn for my people, for my family. A third of it's for the, for the army ants and the baboons. And a third of it, uh, uh, the sun just burns up. Uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty harsh there. So, so what I saw over the course of about a three and a half, four year period was, uh, uh, you know, serious poaching go on. When we first got there, entire villages that were set up in the areas that still had the last few pockets of wildlife. Uh, and so, uh, when they started, uh, doing some serious anti-poaching efforts, it was a community, uh, effort working with the Nortons at Mikasa Safaris, they were able to, to turn the tide on this stuff. And they got some great support from, from Zambia's national parks and wildlife, uh, did a lot of dual patrols together and, uh, they were able to put a stop to probably 80% of the poaching. And, you know, one of the coolest things about this is, was that within about three years, you had about three full breeding seasons where they had stopped 80% of the poaching and the wildlife numbers just exploded. I mean, I, I, last time I was there in September of 2020 and uh, about almost four years from the first trip and 
we saw, I mean, it wasn't, you know, you could see six, seven, eight hundred animals in a day, uh, but they're still missing certain species. I mean, this had the African big five. There's no more rhino. Uh, the elephants came back for the first time in the spring of 2019, but it was just a couple of small groups. Uh, nothing staying there permanently. Uh, you know, there's lion, there's leopard. There used to be fairly decent populations of Cape Buffalo, but really there's just maybe a couple of groups of Dugga boys that are hanging out in the area. And, and, and to give people perspective, this is a 1.2 million acre concession. This is larger than the state of Delaware. This is larger than the Grand Canyon National Park. It's a big place. And so there's great, uh, you know, it's a beautiful place. There's tons of great wildlife habitat. And when the Nortons first showed up in, in 2014 to look at this area and try to see if there was any way they could do anything with them. And, and, and in the beginning, there wasn't even any hunting quota. It wasn't until 2019 that they got a very, very limited quota of hunting. And that's been able to help them, you know, um, re, you know kind of get some money back in the hopper from what they spent. Because the first three years, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars U.S. just trying to establish uh, not only the anti-poaching, but they built a... Uh, a fish farm that has six 30,000 gallon above ground uh, fish tanks where they're growing tilapia, which is a native fish to that area. Uh, in fact, they, they, because it's a native fish, uh, the river there, the Lewin-Semfer River, had been uh, over harvested and poached. And so they actually were able to help restock the river. And now the, the fishermen there are talking about uh, not necessarily seeing huge numbers of fish, but seeing much larger fish. So, you know, there's a lot of success stories. And, it, and it's just a testament to what Mother Nature can do if you kind of just let her on her own to some extent uh, and let her be and not hammer her too hard. She'll come back. And, of course, if the people can see a benefit, you know, I mean, it's, this is about their human rights. You know, why shouldn't they see a benefit for it? And we just have to be wise and mindful of that. Tom, I appreciate it. Um, we just to, to remind everyone, we did drop a link to the uh, Shepherds of Wildlife Society website in the chat box. I encourage everyone to go there, uh, navigate through there and, and watch this really groundbreaking film. I'm seeing some questions piling up in the Q&A. So if all the panelists could go live, I'll um, at this point begin um, posing some of those questions. All right, I'll begin with this one for Erica. With a continent as large as Africa, are there consistencies that you see in terms of wildlife management issues that DSC deals with across the continent? In terms of consistency issues, I think that um, we see a lot of models that work. Um, I think Namibia is a great example of that where they've had real community. Um, they've involved the community in a lot of their um, hunting concessions, which has made a huge difference. It's kind of similar to what um, Tom was talking about and what's in Tom's um, movie. Um, that, that's a difficult question for me to answer. It, I could talk about it for an hour. So ben, did you want to jump in there? I'd love to hear what, what Tom has to say from his experience on the ground. I mean, just what he saw. Like Erica had said, I mean, like the campfire model, incredible. But seeing what, you know, some of the guys and outfitters have been able to do, you know, on their own, like Roland Norton highlighting Shepherds of the Wildlife, I think it's just incredible stuff. So I'd be curious to, to see what Tom says. Yeah, I, I think people have to understand, you know, when you when you talk to these people and you say, hey, you you know, there, there's somebody out here that, you know, in the Western world, the rest of the world thinks that you shouldn't be able to benefit from your hard work and wildlife conservation, you know, their anti poaching work and the things that they're doing on the ground, you know, for them, it's so foreign. They can't understand what you're talking about. I, I mean, literally the translation comes to that. They say that you, these people are are sick in the heart. And so we just we just have to understand that if we can help these people in their development, I mean, that's where we should be putting our efforts and it shouldn't be in banning trophies. I mean, why create why tell them that they can't get any value? Why? That's that's make something less valuable. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not what we do here in the United States or in Europe. Uh, that's that's work on development programs. That's work with the outfitters and the operators on the ground. And, and there's so many ways that we can change this model. I mean, really, we have huge threats 
uh, today, and we've been facing it for a long time, but they're gaining momentum. And that's this human tsunami population. I mean, you go to places like uh, Ethiopia, there's over 110 or 120 million people there. And, and talking to operators, uh, hunting operators there like Jason Russos, I mean, he'll, he's saying we're losing land left and right. There's places we, that we hunted five, 10 years ago that there's not a tree left because all of these resources are being decimated because of this onslaught of humanity. So if we really wanna do what's right and we wanna do something that's gonna allow for us to have lions and elephants and Cape Buffalo and Plains game, you know, in perpetuity and healthy populations, and we've gotta we've got do something about the habitat. And that's the one thing about these hunting concessions. I mean, I've seen the data. I mean, there's over, you know, over uh, I think two times the amount of land mass uh, of all the national parks in Southern Africa are protected because of hunting. And so we've, as a community, as a society, we have to realize that these people out there that are busting their butts, and these people aren't making millions of dollars, these hunters out, th this is a passion, this is a lifestyle. This is no different than uh, our ranchers here in Montana where I live. I mean, they're, they're, these folks might be, they might be, uh, you know, uh, cash poor, or they're cash poor and they're land rich, but the reality there is, is that if they don't see a value to having wildlife on their lands, they're not going to take care of them. That's no different than we're in Zambia or any other part of, of the world for that matter. And so it's important that we start working on development programs and making sure these programs are transparent, uh, that we get our governments to help support these people in so much as to move that needle when it comes to development, long-term agreements, making sure that there's plenty of, of uh, the financials are proper so that we can make sure that these folks can create development opportunities in their own communities. And, you know, and hunting is only going to be one part of this, this economic model because there's so many needs, whether it be health care, whether it be education, uh, you know, just jobs. And, you know, if people have a job, then they don't have to plant on sub, uh, uh, substandard soils. They don't have to worry about climate change, which is really affecting the rainfall in parts of Zambia where I've been filming, where their crops are failing at ever increasing rates. So if they can go buy that food and they can protect that wildlife, and that could even include things like biocarbon credits and carbon sequestration. Uh, sequestration. Uh, I can't get that out today. I got a dry mouth here. But anyways, I think you guys know what I'm talking about. So yeah, I mean, there's so many incredible things we can do. And we, we need to really stop telling the world that, uh, that hunters are, are the evil, terrible people out there. Because quite frankly, without them, these people would have a really tough time surviving and we would not have that wildlife. And so we need to use this as a stepping stone. We have to realize that these efforts, the things that, that we're all fighting for are so important to, to the to protecting these environments, to the biodiversity of these environments. And if we want to have a, a healthy and clean planet in the future, then we've got to be proactive about it. And, and hunting bans, hunting trophy bans, all of them are absolutely the opposite. They're the antichrist of wildlife conservation. Thank you all. Um, I have another question here. It's for all panelists. And uh, Tom, you were recently in DC and Ben and Erica, you're both uh, based out of DC. So um, really this you know, would apply to everyone as the question uh, proposes. What are some good foundational starting points for convincing elected officials who are novices to the topic that trophy hunting can be a valuable tool for conservation. So really, what's the first step? I'll jump in on this one and take it out of DC. I think a really good example was, um, it happened during, um, during the fight in Connecticut. We had a member of CSF, pro, pro hunter, on the committee considering the trophy ban um, who had concerns um, with opposing it. He wanted to support it. And he said during the committee, you know, we can't allow people to come into JFK, come into our airport with rhino horns in their suitcase. So, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not how it works, right? That's the talk of a novice. So we followed up with him and outlined, you know, in a PowerPoint presentation, did it over Zoom, kind of walking through, like Erica touched on, how much regulation is already in place through Fish and Wildlife Service, um, you know, through what happens in the range country where the animals harvested. Walking through all that, opened his eyes, changed his vote to opposing the trophy ban, and ultimately he made remarks during the vote, encouraging his folks to learn more on the issue before voting. 
Um, so I think really what it goes back down to is just communication. I mean, when you work on this issue all the time, it can feel like you're repeating yourself. But for a lot of audiences, they're hearing it for the first time. So I think a lot of it's having not just dialogue, but ongoing dialogue and, and communication. And a lot of that goes to, you know, connecting the, the authorities, the people that it's affecting with the decision makers. I think that every time that happens, it really opens eyes. I'm sure that, you know, Tom could agree with it from his visit to DC, having seen, you know, folks that craft some of this language when they're actually faced with what the realities of it back on the ground makes them think twice about it. I've seen it, you know, affect change at all levels, whether it's in Brussels or California or Washington, DC. So a lot of it's creating the, the forum, the venue to be able to have the conversations. And we, we've seen a lot of good success in these. Um, just recently, you know, SCI got back from Brussels where we hosted a forum with the European Parliament, is Africa being heard? Um, and joined during their panel was uh, the Namibian Minister of Environment, Secretary General of CITES, a uh, member of IUCN, you know, the scientific voice, a uh, member of the European Commission, basically the, their, you know, administrative arm for, for parliament over there. Um, I had a really good discussion. And I think a big part of that too was not siloing it and not having the audience just made up of people that are already basically on your side or take a little convincing to get on your side, but have the other viewpoint represented there as well. So we made sure, you know, in that venue to have anti, you know, hunting organizations in the room, to have CBD there, um, let them have the mic and ask their questions. But at the end of the day, they're hearing right from the people that it affects, and it really weakens their, their positions when those facts are laid out bare. Um, just one other interesting piece that happened, you know, during that event was there was a Q&A at the end, and the president of our Swiss chapter um, called out, you know, IUCN and World Wildlife F Federation for supporting trophy hunting. They are on record supporting trophy hunting, um, but not really advertising it on their website. It's very hard to find those, those statements at times. Um, there's a reporter in the room, and he went up to the president afterwards of our Swiss chapter and said, is that true? Does WWF support trophy hunting? You know, yeah, they, they do. Look it up. It's on the website. It's hard to find. So, they went back and looked at it and found it, and they went to WWF in Belgium, where at the time we were seeing movement in the Belgian parliament on a trophy ban, and they said, WWF, do you support trophy hunting? Well, yeah, yeah, we do. Well, then do you oppose the trophy ban in the Belgian parliament? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess we have to, right? So they ended up being on record from that conversation, um, which opened a lot of other eyes, because when other people see groups like you know, IUCN and WWF that you know, as Erica had mentioned, aren't, you know, right-wing organizations um, saying that they stand with the people in Africa and, and oppose, you know, legislation that's going to hurt them. Um, it opens up a different eyes in, in a different part of the community. So I think there's, yeah, it goes back to dialogue, ongoing dialogue and fostering the conversation. Thanks, Ben. Um... Erica and Tom, I, I know we're, we're bumping up against time here and I do have closing remarks. Um, I may email both of you and if you have a response to that question, we can share it with all the attendees as well um, and, and send that out to them if that works for you. Sounds good. Great, well, I'm gonna close the Q&A session and begin wrapping up the webinar. I wanna thank all of our panelists for their participation in this discussion and for their continued support um, towards our nation's sporting traditions. Similarly, CSF would like to extend its deepest appreciation to all those of you in attendance for taking part in this event. We hope you all will join us for the next virtual policy webinar that CSF is hosting on July 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern for a discussion on America's charismatic megafauna, modern challenges associated with predator management. Additionally, for those of you who are interested in a more immersive experience, uh, on these and other sportsman related policy topics, we encourage you to join us in Bozeman, Montana for the annual NASC Sportsman Legislative Summit from November 29th through December 2nd. This hallmark event will, um, for state legislative sportsman's caucuses and the broader sporting community will feature three days of policy discussions, demonstrations, and outdoor activities. 
Early bird registration is now open and additional information can be found at nasksummit.org. If you have any questions at this point, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact information has been shared in the chat box. Uh, thanks again. We hope to see you all throughout the rest of the webinar series. And thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks for having me.